I would like to speak to you today from Genesis chapter 11 concerning the Tower of Babel and the confusion of tongues. Now, if we were to attempt to set forth the two central affirmations of the Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, they would be without question the fact that God is holy and righteous and that man is wicked and sinful. In fact, man, soon after Adam's fall into sin, became so wicked that it was necessary for God to pronounce judgment upon the world and destroy all flesh upon the earth. We read of this in Genesis 6 through 9. The only flesh that was spared from this terrible judgment upon sin and rebellion was Noah, his wife, his sons, their wives, and yet their descendants within a few generations again forgot God, rebelled against him, and it was necessary for God to send judgment upon them again, this time by the confusion of their speech and scattering them over the earth. I would like us to see that this story of the Tower of Babel pictures exactly the nature of the sin that man has been guilty of down through the ages, the kind of sinful desire that entered the heart of Adam and caused his fall into sin is the same kind of sin that corrupted the hearts of those who were destroyed in the flood. And then we see it brought to focus again in the people's attempt to build the Tower of Babel. Now, what was the sin of Adam that diseased all of his descendants we see in the hearts of all men that is so perfectly demonstrated in the attempt to build the Tower of Babel? Well, we can answer this question. What is the nature of the sin in all hearts from which we must be delivered by looking at Genesis 11 and asking, why did these people want to build a tower? This tower was something like the shape and size of the Egyptian pyramids, except instead of having smooth sides, it had various levels or steps and a temple on the top. They saw mountains reaching into the clouds, and so they shaped their tower like a mountain for the purpose of establishing a kind of a figurative connection between heaven and earth. Now then, how does this attempt to build this great tower reveal to us the basic nature of sin which dwells in the hearts of all men? The nature of this sin is described in verse 4 of Genesis 11. And they said, Come now, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The first thing we see about the nature of sin is reflected by their statement, let us make a name for ourselves. Now, man was created in the image of God to glorify God's name, but man's desire from the beginning is to make a name for himself. You see it today in religious circles in the secular world as well. So we see here the pride and vanity of humanity, of the human heart. This wicked desire that men have for reputation, self-glory, rather than wanting to glorify God's name, man's desire is to make a name for himself. Men, women, boys, girls, the uppermost thought in their minds is, come and let us make a name for ourselves. The builders of Babel said it. It was Pharaoh's purpose in resisting God to make a name for himself. They built their pyramids to memorialize their names this was the sin of the kings of Israel. They rejected God and sought to make a name for themselves, establish their own kingdoms on their own names. This was true of the rulers of Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, and so on. Not only is this the basic desire of the leaders of history, but this is a sin that besets all men, small or great, boys or girls, and so on. Come, let us make a name for ourselves is the basic desire. Take, for example, the boys and girls in school. They're not taught to prepare their lives with the end in view that they can be of service to their fellow man or to God, but their thinking is always directed toward being a success, becoming popular, being well-known. Why, the motto in America is common, let's make a name for ourselves. If there is one emphasis taught in the schools, the homes, the churches in America today, it is to build self-esteem. People are not taught today to learn a trade or profession or skills for the good of others, service to their fellow man, their neighbor. But if you follow this or that trade or become this or that and get an education, you will be a success in the world and make a name for yourself. The girls are told to dress seductively, to learn to dance, to know the latest tunes on rock and roll or disco. 
to become a cheerleader, to attend a charm school, so they'll be popular, be a success, make a name for themselves. Now, if you will reflect for a moment, you will have to admit that we're being taught to measure success in terms of money, in dollars and cents, the size of the car we drive, where we go to church, the neighborhood we live in, how many automatic appliances we have, and whether or not we have made a name for ourselves in the world. In fact, where is the parent who doesn't want his child to be a success? Now, the only success the Bible knows anything about is meeting the Lord Jesus Christ and obeying Him. Do you not measure success in terms of making a name for yourself, being popular, accepted, well-liked, well-known, financially independent? Well, the world says you've succeeded when you can make a name like that for yourself. The basic sin of Adam was he wanted not to live for God's glory and honor his name, but to make a name for himself. The basic sin of those who lived in the time of the flood was to promote themselves. The basic sin of the Tower of Babel builders was the same. The cry in the heart of all mankind seems to be, Come, and let us make a name for ourselves. The mark of a true Christian, however, is his desire to forget self, abase self, crucify self, and live for Christ. Read Galatians 2.20, Matthew 16.24, Philippians chapter 2. Too often the troubles in the churches among Christians is letting this old sin of Babel creep back into their hearts, and their only concern is for themselves as individuals. Their interests, their future, their welfare is centered around themselves. But the first lesson a Christian must learn, he's no longer to seek to make a name for himself, but to promote the name of Christ. Anyway, your name has been changed if you're a child of God. It is now Christian or Christian. You're to make that name known by your life and your testimony. Now, the second thing we see in verse 4 about the nature of sin that's in the hearts of all men not only do men attempt to exalt themselves, but these people wanted to build a city and tower. Now, why was this a sin upon which God pronounced judgment? They said, let us build a city and a tower, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, the reason this was sin is because this is in defiance of God's command to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill up the earth. And God blessed Adam, this is Genesis 1, and said to be fruitful and multiply and replenish or literally fill up the earth and subdue it and to have dominion over the earth. In other words, God told Adam and Eve to multiply, to scatter, subdue the earth. They would have no fear. He would be their God. He would give them protection and security. But man's rebellious heart said no. Let us put our trust in ourselves, our strength, our might, our armies, our walled cities, our great towers. Let us stay together. Let's build a city and not be scattered. Now we see this defiance illustrated on every page of history, how nation after nation has attempted to build its own security and trust in its own armed strength, the force of arms. David himself had to undergo a terrible punishment because of this very sin. He numbered the army, according to Second Samuel 24, because he wanted to feel secure in the number of soldiers that he had at his side. America, the nations of the world, are not trusting in God, but in the number and size of their weapons, their army, navy, air force, even in their economic strength, prosperity. And so they have to build for themselves a Tower of Babel, an atomic stockpile that we're told is our security against any invasion from Russia or China or whatever. But this kind of security is a false security. It's a Tower of Babel, a defiance, a mockery to God. When you trust in anything outside the almighty power of God alone, who alone created, who alone can destroy or save or deliver, then you've built yourself a Tower of Babel that will one day be destroyed. Man's sin is of such a nature that he refuses to trust in God. He rejects God. He puts his faith in material things, in himself, in his own power, in his own abilities. He says, in effect, come, let us build a city and a tower, lest we be scattered abroad by the enemy. The divine command went out to scatter, subdue the earth, trust God. But man's reply was, trust God? No, let us build our own security and trust ourselves. And so they chose security in unity rather than in obedience. 
It's interesting that we see just the opposite response in the life of Abraham when God commanded him to leave his home, sever all of his ties with his family, friends, the society that he grew up in. He didn't complain. He didn't say that he couldn't make a name for himself out in some foreign, unknown land. But he obeyed God, just like the Christian does. You see, Abraham's obedience depicts the obedience of a true Christian who puts his hope, his trust, his faith in Christ in his security. The city that the Christian seeks is not the one that they build in this world, but the heavenly Jerusalem, whose tower, our temple, is not made with hands, but we're told it is the Lord himself. And they don't seek to make a name for themselves, but their name shall be called Christian, as I say, Christians. Now, we also see in this account in the Tower of Babel how the sinful heart of man in his pride says, let us erect a tower of good works, you know, philosophy, religion, and climb up to heaven our own way. I'll put, they say, my faith and my ability, my philosophy. I will live a good life, a life that I believe that is morally and ethically acceptable to society and to God, and thus lay a foundation for my tower to reach into heaven, to get to heaven on my own terms. And what was God's punishment upon such plans, such rebellion? Confusion. We read that he confused their language and they had to be scattered one from another anyway. If there's anything that characterizes the helplessness, the tragic condition of man, it's his state of utter confusion. He is in every way confused and bewildered. And you see that in this account here. This proves the point that sin brings its own punishment. You see, the one thing they were trying to avoid was confusion, being scattered, and their punishment was that they became so confused they had to scatter. Therefore, the name of the place is called Babel. The Tower of Babel has become a monument to man's sinful pride, his foolishness, his rebellion. You see, what they hoped would bring them glory became an everlasting monument to their folly. Confusion was the result of their sin. Confusion exists wherever man rebels against God. Confusion reigns in the world today in the hearts of sinners. Anyone would know that. The sinner says, well, I'm not confused. I know where I am, where I'm going. I understand the speech of others, he says. And yet the sinner is so confused, he doesn't know he is confused. No, sinners do not know where they are. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they're going. And they do not understand the speech of those who try to speak to them truth. You say that you know where you're going. Do you know where you're going? Without Christ, you're going into an eternity without God and hope, into eternal punishment, except you turn to Jesus Christ by faith today.